Okay, as I mentioned long time ago, when I first started the Book of Romans, the, the church itself was a mixture of Gentiles and the Jewish people. Because Jewish were expelled from the Rome for a while, and they came back later, they found out that a lot of Gentiles are leading the church. So they were not really happy about that. So there's some issues among themselves as church members, as Christians. So if you look at verse 1, it says, As for the one who is weak in faith, it's really difficult to define what it means, weak in faith. Paul does not explain anything. But obviously the audience, the recipients knew what he was referring to. And each individual issues that he mentioned here, same thing. It's really difficult what kind of food issue they were talking about and they issues. But we can actually assume, based on their background, what could have been the issue here. So weak in faith means what? It's talking about Christians. He's not talking about non-Christians, unbelievers, whether they're in church or outside the church, it doesn't matter. He's not referring to unbelievers. He's referring to the people who have assurance of salvation, believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord, and live as Christians. But in some way, they're not mature enough. Somehow, based on this definition, weak in faith. So please note, these are the people who are Christians, especially in church. In verse 2, talks about one person believes he may eat anything. Right? I think so. I think that's the right way. While the weak person, Paul describes as a weak person, eats only vegetables. Is that because they're weak? Because they only eat vegetables? I don't think so. Uh, some vegetarians can build some muscles too. Right? So, but weak person, one person versus weak person, he's comparing and contrasting these two group of people. But he says this, Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Don't criticize those people who only eat vegetables because they're Christians too. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. The vegetarians are saying they're eating all those things, this food that was um, you know, used for idol worship, and they're still eating that. That's no good. And I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 8 later on. But these are the, the issues that they had. Think about these issues. Again, different backgrounds. So they have different background meaning, but they have different spiritual background as well. Before they become Christians, most likely they had some idolatry happening in their lives. It could be some atheists, but think about it though. Atheists were hard to find back in the old days. That's kind of a new trend too. Whether you were Gentiles or Jew, or whether you worship true God or not, you worship something back in the old days. There's so many deities out there. Right? Gentile gods and all those things, and Apollos and different, different gods, they worship everything. Their animism and all those things, you know, you know, mountain god, sky god, whatever it is. So it was not really be, be, uh, between the, the believer and the atheist, but because they have some background, a spiritual background, what did they do? They brought their own habits, the religious rituals. Okay, if that something happened there, then I shouldn't do that. Even though the Christianity, the Bible doesn't say that's wrong or right. The people are making their own decisions. Think about it, guys. When you're in church, some people do something more than other people, right? And some people, may, let's say, early morning service. That's the like, distinctive um, ritual that Korean churches have. And just because we have early morning service every day, we cannot criticize those people who are not doing that. Right? Vice versa. 
people who are not doing that cannot say, oh, they're just doing something meaningless, right? So don't criticize each other, and you have to acknowledge who they are. And this one, same thing. Remember, Jews versus Gentiles are all mixed up together. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Meaning, if you look at this verse alone, a lot of people may think, oh, it's our conscience. True. But this passage is talking about Christian conscience. Remember? They're all Christians. It's weak in faith, strong maybe, but still they're all Christians. So their own mind meaning it's Christian conscience. It's not about my own conscience without God. What could be the issue for this, this group of people? With a strong Jewish background, they're still observing the Sabbath. Saturday, right? They thought Sabbath is a special day, and then they just observe it as a special day. Gentiles don't care about Sabbath, but they're Christians, so they think every day is holy day. You know, I'm going to worship God. So, and people are criticizing each other. He's not doing this, or why is he doing that, right? But in church, that should not happen. All right. And think about this, because when you go to church, maybe larger church might be worse. If you go to a larger church, we have a lot of people there, and people have different backgrounds. Of course, the best ways to become united, stronger way, uh, as a Christian, and you have similar value. But we're not talking about cookie-cutter kind of Christianity. You all have to be identical. No, that's not what we're saying but you have to have a same direction of what the Bible teaches. Minor issues like this, you shouldn't be too concerned about. All right? Anyway, the Sabbath versus no Sabbath, that was the difference. But what does the Bible say? Is this. You have to accept them because God has welcomed them. ESV version says welcome, which is really, uh, in, in a way, a commentary. It's not a direct translation. If you directly translate the word, it's more like just accept those people. God accepted them. Welcome him and welcome, right? Same thing. If you replace it with accept, it makes sense too, grammatically speaking. But the connotation is more than just accepting them, merely, okay, you're okay. It's not like that. Welcome those people, because they are Christians as well, brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? The reason why we can welcome them is because God welcomed those people. It's always like that, right? And Bible says, you do this, you do that, because God has done that already for you, right? And this one, I'm going to have to explain a little more in verse 4 later. I already explained this one. All right. And Paul somehow explains the reason why we should not judge others, pass judgment on those things. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So he's asking those people, whether it's strong or weak, based on this passage, you cannot pass judgment on those people. Because the servant of another, this servant, this servant here, in Greek word, it's not doulos, slave. It's not diakonos, it's not servant. This is a different word. If you actually translate it properly, it's household slave. Household slave. Meaning, you are very close to your master. 
You're not a slave working out in the farm or yard somewhere out away from you. Household meaning you stay at home. You actually help master all the time. You're right there. You're the one staying at home, helping him out. Very close. Imagine this. If somebody's doing that, I'm working out in the farm as a slave. I cannot criticize that person. Because master will judge that person, whether he is doing it right or wrong. That's what the Bible says. So, Bible says each and every one of us is household servant in this context. So we shouldn't judge each other. We shouldn't criticize each other because God is the one who is the master of all of us individually as a Christian. Right? So before his own master, everybody is uh, a servant in that sense. That's what he says. Simple as that. <clears throat> yeah. So, in a practical side, though, uh, when you go out to college and and if you work somewhere, same thing. Judging other people is never a good idea. While you're looking for First Corinthians eight, let's go there. Because Matthew chapter seven says, if you judge somebody, you will be judged. The same measure that you use to judge other people as well, right? So you got to be very careful about that. And we read about the Proverbs chapter four earlier, and it says, just put away all those crooked speeches, right? Crooked speech. Think about it. Why do we have to do that? It's for our own benefit as well but for the benefit of other believers in Christ. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 through 13. Verse 4 through 13. By the way, if you read the 1 Corinthians, you will find a lot of issues, subject matter that Paul covered. Chapter 8, verse 1 starts with now concerning food offered to idols, right? So this entire chapter is about that issue. If you flip to chapter 7, it says now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And he talks about marriage, right? Um And chapter 5 starts like, it is actually reported that there is a sexual immorality among you. So he's addressing those subject matters and issues. Uh, Almost each chapter has distinctive subject matter. For chapter 8, it's about the food that was offered to idols, right? And verse 4 through 6, verse 4 through 6, let's read them together. All right, chapter 8, verse 4 through 6. Ready? Go. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, it is indeed there are many gods and many idols. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and all whom exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. And verse 7 says, However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So, people have different opinions and different uh, different understandings about the truth. Verse 4 through 6 is the one that Paul says, It doesn't really matter whether the food is offered to idols or not. You can eat that, guys. That's fine. But not everybody has this knowledge. So basically what he's doing, what is he doing here? Educating people. Guys, it's okay. It's okay. But please note that not everybody has that understanding. Verse 8 says, Food will not command us to God. 
we are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. So Paul is concerned about the weak people, people with weak faith, according to his words in the book of Romans. So just because of your freedom, you know the truth, you're doing something, but be careful about your freedom, your behavior, because it may affect the people with weak faith. It continues. Verse 10 says, For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol temple, will be not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols. So if somebody believes, as a Christian, somebody believes that eating those food is wrong, they thought, it was a misunderstanding, right? Lack of understanding. But if they see, if they see someone who's eating that food, they believe that's wrong, but they're doing that because they believe they have freedom to do so because with the knowledge based on this idol versus true God, it doesn't really matter. So I'm eating that. But when they see that, they're going to be discouraged. They thought that guy has a stronger faith or mature faith, but he's doing something wrong. So this person may feel bad about it, discouraged. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people leave church. First of all, before you leave church, I mean, not you guys, but those people who left church, my question to them is, you need to talk to those people first. What's going on here? I thought this was wrong. Somehow you have to have a dialogue with that person before you just pack up and leave. I don't like this. This, this People are crazy. That's wrong. and I don't want to stay here. Leave. Talk to them what the reason is. Right? But think about it, though. How many times we did it in our faith in our spiritual life caused other people to stumble. Think about it. A lot of times it's perceived as self-righteousness. We didn't mean that. Let's say let's say this person is strong has strong faith and I don't. That person says something, right? But to me that's self-righteousness. Yeah. Oh, you, you think you're better than me? That kind of attitude. I can feel that way. But he or she doesn't mean that. Then I have to ask that question as a person with a weak faith. What do you mean by that? You mean you're better than me? Then that person, if he's, he or she is a true Christian with a mature spiritual growth, he or she will be able to talk to you what he or she meant. Right? It comes back to our ordinary life situation too. A lot of times we misunderstand people based on lack of communication. Just don't ask any question and just assume that that's what it meant. I don't like it. Pack up and leave, right? So think about it. Paul's warning that. Verse 11. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed the brother for whom Christ died. Paul is saying, don't do that, guys. That person may actually leave the church because of that, your freedom, even though you didn't mean to offend anyone. Is it only eating the food? Your speech, your speech as well. You may tell the truth, but the truth has to be gentle in many sense. Non-believers can be unbelievers can be offended by it. What too bad? It just happens because they don't have truth. But among the believers, you got to be very careful about the way you speak as well. So because of this situation, it could happen. Verse 12 says, "Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ." Paul says it's a sinning against Christ. This is it's a really severe thing to, to ponder upon. Verse 13, what's his conclusion? Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. 
Paul's point is this. No matter how right you are, no matter how good you are, be always mindful about other brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. It's a really tough thing to do. Doesn't mean we have to accept everything they do. Whatever they do, it's okay. Just don't say anything. Don't correct them. No. That's not what it means either. You got to be careful what you do. But what does Matthew chapter 18 says? If a brother, Christian, if your brother commits sin against you, you got to go talk to that person. That's wrong. You got to correct that person. If he doesn't listen to you, go there with other people. If he doesn't listen, you have to bring him to church, entire church, and command him, I mean, admonish him to change things that he's done. If he doesn't listen, what does the Bible say? Treat them, treat them as unbeliever. But you've got to do your best. It might be two different situations, but it's not just tolerating everything that they do, but you got to make a decision. Okay, Am I offending somebody? Be careful about that. And because of my speech or because of my behavior, are the weak Christians become destroyed based on this very strong expression here. They will be destroyed. Yeah. Crushed in their mind. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. Think about this. And then we're going to go to the, the conclusion. It's Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 17. Twelve through seventeen, let's read them together. Colossians three, twelve through seventeen. Ready? Go. Put on then these God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, so which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful that the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through you. This, I, I like this passage. But think about it. Just revisit, reread it out loud on your own later. That's the way it's supposed to be in our church. Any Christian church should be bound by His love, God's love. Of course, we can have some complaints, but you have to forgive each other. You have to love one another as Christians. And it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly because to do so, you have to have this word of God in you. It's not your own effort. It's not your own um, work to make this happen. You've got to dwell in God's word first and then it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It says this, Verse 15 also says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, the which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Right. What kind of peace are we talking about? God's peace. And Jesus said, The peace that I give you, it's not the same as the world gives you. Yeah. It's the word of God, the peace from Christ, that will enable us to become Stronger as one body of Christ. 
we had a conversation about this one a few days ago. We're not trying to be united. We're already one body in Christ. So you have to get stronger, that's all. Right? We're not really separate limbs and getting together. No, we're already one body. You get to work together to become stronger and stronger. 